All right, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I do thank you for this word tonight, and I do thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for the blessings of the word. But Father, as we've asked before, we want you to give us the truth. We want you to unfold and to reveal the truth. And I thank you that you continue to unfold Rhema to the body of Christ. I thank you that since 1955, you've been unfolding this truth. So, Lord, let us grab a hold of what you've been teaching the church line upon line, precept upon precept. Father, we ask you to have your way by your spirit and by your anointing. Let the word flow. For, Father, I yield to you and ask you to have your way with us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Tonight, we uh, are entitling this message, uh, Miscellaneous Scriptures. And so we're just going to have a little smorgasbord of some little, a couple of scriptures that, that uh, deal with this topic of homosexuality and, and the Bible. Now we have already, as I've stated, looked at the, all the scriptures that deal with homosexuality and Bible that people try to, to uh, utilize in terms of a negative uh, aspect. And so we're well beyond that now. Last week we began looking at eunuchs. This week we're going to start looking at other scriptures. Now, I do realize that what is here um, may be a debatable issue. Some people may look at that and say, well, that's about gay people. And some people may look at it and say, oh, it's no way. There's no way at all. And uh, it, it's, not, it's not up for debate. In other words, uh, if people feel that uh, it's not at all about gay people, well, that's all right. I'm simply going to present tonight the facts. I'm going to show what's there. And it, these kinds of scriptures that we look at tonight, these miscellaneous ones, are ones that you draw your own conclusion. And uh, I've drawn mine. And uh, so it's up to you. If, you want, if, yours is, uh, if yours is the same as mine, that's great. If not, it doesn't make any difference to me. We don't, we're still in the same body of Christ. We're not going to argue over it. We're not going to have any fight over it. But I just want to show it to you so that you can ponder it, and you can pray about it, and you can look at it, OK? One of the first ones that got me excited was this one in Luke chapter 17, verse 34. And I will read that, and then I want to uh, look at it in its context. I'm just going to read this one little verse, and then we'll uh, see what on earth Jesus is talking about. Uh, you look at it in its context. Remember, we don't look at scriptures and just pull them out of their context. We look at them in their context. So that's what we want to do tonight. Um, Luke 17:34 says this. I'm reading from the King James Version. It says, I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Now let's go back a little bit uh, in order to see what on earth he's talking about. But here we've got a scripture where there's two men in one bed. Unusual. Very unusual. <laughs> so let's see what it's talking about. We pick up with verse, go back to verse 24. And Jesus says, For as the lightning that lighteneth out of one part of heaven shines unto the other part under heaven, so also shall the Son of Man be in his day. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. This, the one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Well, what Jesus is talking about here is the end times. And he's talking specifically in this passage about two people being together in the same place at the same time, and all of a sudden one of them is missing. One of us, all of a sudden, somebody's gone. It's the rapture that Jesus is talking about. So here's a foreshadowing of the rapture. Now, when is the rapture going to happen? In Jesus' day? 
it, when he was walking the shores of Galilee. It's going to happen before he returns to rule and to reign this planet. So we know that the rapture and what Jesus is talking about in these scriptures is the last days, which we know already from scripture we're in the last days. This is the wind up. This is the wrap up. So when he talks about two men being in one bed together, he's talking about in our society, not in Palestine society in, you know, the year one or the year 50 or the year 90. He's talking about this generation, this time frame. So, and Jesus knew exactly what he was talking about. And he was saying, in that day, you're going to have two women, they're working out in the field together, or two men working in the field together, two women working at the grinding mill uh, together, and you'll have two men in one bed. Now, for that to be in the context of a modern society that we live in, there's only one thing generally that it would mean if, uh, if two men are sleeping in one bed together uh, today. Um, even in, even in, uh, even in uh, Arabic communities and Arabic societies, men would not be sleeping in one bed together. I know that because uh, my grandmother really had, a, had to sit down and talk to me about how that looks to the neighbors. You just don't do that sort of thing. My grandmother, who's Arabic and born in Israel, born in uh, Bethlehem, you know, it just doesn't look right. Now, if it, was, if it was okay in Arabic societies, then my grandma would say, well, what's the big deal? But that's not, that isn't okay. So even in Arabic societies, much less American societies, uh, you know, two men are sleeping together in the same bed. That's a very suspicious, it's unle unless they're brothers, unless they're, you know, uh, then they'd be little boys, but they're not little boys, they're men. So uh, when you look at this word though, so verse 34 is a, uh, now it, it appears that what it's talking about is that you've got two men who are gay, or at least they sleep together, whatever is the story there. And uh, though these men sleep together, one obviously is a believer, and the other one is not a believer. And uh, do we see that in today's society? Do we see, uh, you know, male couples unequally yoked? Yes, we do. And that's what Jesus is saying here, that in that day, there'll be one who will be left behind and there'll be one that'll be taken. Um, but it isn't just uh, male couples that that'll happen in because that just happens in all kinds of coupled relationships. You know, in any home life, there are lots of homes in America and lots of homes around the world where one spouse, two people who live in, usually two people in, you could say in today's society that sleep in the same bed are probably spouses. And one that uh, is gone and one is, uh, remains, obviously they're unequally yoked. And that is true whether it's heterosexual or homosexual, you know, nonetheless, that's still going on. That's happening today. And that's what he's telling us about. But I want to, uh, you know, we, we, we have recognized that, that the church in its traditions is so homophobic. They're so anti anything that could be possibly uh, be gay positive that they go out of their way to make the, I mean, really out of their way, to make it not be so, not be what was said, and to uh, try to cover up. So I want to share with you uh, from seven different translations what this says about two men being in one bed. In the King James Version, which I just read you, it says two men will be in one bed, one will be taken, the other will be left. In the NIV, it says two people will be in one bed, and one will be taken and the other left. They're not the least bit uh, willing to allow these two people to be men. They, they just can't deal with that possibility at all. The uh, Living Bible, <laughs> uh, maybe I should save that for last, it's so good. We'll go on to the revised, the revised version says, there will be two in one bed. Doesn't tell us to what, to uh, oranges, to uh, pillows, to cows, whatever, to whatever is going to be in the same bed. One will be taken and one will be left. The New American Standard Bible, which is, I've been uh, very partial towards because of its being such a good literal translation, says there will be two men in one bed. The Amplified, 
which, as you know, is the Amplified is a good translation, and the Amplified will take many of the words in Greek or in Hebrew and give you all of those shades of meanings. Therefore, it's very difficult to read sometimes because it's very wordy, but it's intentionally wordy so that you get the, the flavor. And it says, there will be two men in one bed. The New King James Version says, there will be two men in one bed. Now the Living Bible says, that night, two men will be asleep in the same room. <laughs> Which makes you wonder, now, in Greek does it say, two men will be in the same bed or in the same room? There's a world of difference in implication, you know. So the word for bed is 2825 in Strong's, and it means bed. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? It doesn't mean room. It means bed. <laughs> it means bed. So the word bed in Greek, it means bed. The other thing that it means is couch. So now you've got two men and one couch together. Now that's even more interesting. So um, that could be a fold-out couch, a hide-a-bed. We don't know what kind of couch, but it's the only other thing that the bed means. And it comes from the word 2827, which means to slant, to slope. In other words, to recline. So two men would be reclining from the root word together, or two men would be on a couch or a bed together, not in the same room. But you have to remember that the Living Bible, first of all, is not a translation, it's a paraphrase. Second of all, the Living Bible is the same Bible that's so paranoid about homosexual potential, even shading, that in Romans 16, 16, where the Bible says literally, greet one another, brethren, with a holy kiss. The Romans 16, 16 in the Living Bible doesn't tell the brethren to greet one another with a holy kiss. It says, shake hands warmly with one another. <laughs> so I think they're a little nervous about something. They've got a little something to be a little, a little nervous about. Um, the, it, I looked up uh, the part where it says two men. And I was curious about that. Well, the word men is not actually there in the text. That's interesting. But what is there is the word duo. You've heard, we, that's a familiar word to us, but that's Greek, that's Greek, and it's the word two. So the word two, or the number two, T-W-O, is what's there in Greek. But what does two mean? Two means two of the same thing, correct? If I'm gonna say, go get two, you're going to go get two of the same thing, of whatever I ask you to get two of. So uh, where this word duo is also used in the Bible, it's used always meaning two of the same things for the most part. For instance, in, uh, these are just scriptures in Matthew, okay, where the word duo is used. In Matthew 4, 18 and 21, two brethren. Talking about Christian, uh, the Christian disciples there. Um, uh, no man can serve two masters. Uh, two blind men in Matthew 9, 27. 10, 29, two sparrows are not two sparrows sold for a farthing or sold for a penny. Uh, Matthew 11, 2, two of his disciples. Um, five loaves and two fishes duo or two hands and two feet in Matthew 18, 18, or Matthew 26, 60, two false witnesses, two of the same thing. So, um, so you had to say, well, is it two men? Well, out of seven translations, five of them say absolutely yes, it's two men. They don't have any question, it's two, what? It's two men. The only others are simply the revised, which says there are two in one bed, and the only other, so one out of seven, is NIV, which says two people. So everybody, majority rules here, say two men are in one bed, and that's what Jesus was saying. He said duo, in one couch, duo in one bed. And now realizing that that was the end times, I believe that, uh, you see, because Jesus could have very easily said, uh, and none translates this as saying 
a man and a woman in one bed. And that's what he would have said. If he was talking about husband and wife, he's talked about adultery in Matthew 19. He talks about, you know, a man and a woman come together. They leave their mother, their father. They become one flesh. He's talked about men and women together many places in the Bible. And if he wanted to talk about a husband and a wife being in one bed, he wouldn't say two because two implies two of the same thing. And a man and a woman are not the same thing. So he wouldn't have said two. He would have said a man and a woman like he did in Matthew 19. So, uh, and, and in fact, not one of those seven translations, not one ever thought that he was meaning a man and a woman. So nobody translates it that way. In fact, as I say, almost without exception, they just say two men are in one bed, just the way he said it. So, uh, so I think that's kind of intriguing and I think that's interesting because it's in the last days and we have to ask ourselves then if two men are in one bed in the last days in our day and in our age why are two men together in the same bed I mean just think call up your mom and say you know I've got a next door neighbor and uh, it's two guys and they both sleep in the same bed what do they you think your parents are gonna think anything anything unusual about that <laughs> Does that imply anything? You know, does it mean anything? Uh, or uh, they don't have a bed, so they sleep together on the same couch. You know, does that, uh, does that say anything to anybody? I think it has a great deal of connotations, and I know Jesus was aware of what he was saying. So he knew he doesn't put any judgment on it. He isn't saying two wicked men are in one bed or two vile reprobate men are in one bed. He just says two are in the same bed, but one's not a Christian. One stays behind. And that's simply what he says about it. So when people say, um, well, did Jesus say anything about homosexuality? Well, here's something he could have been saying, very likely could have been saying, just simply making a mention of it in passing. That's significant because he has opportunity to bring judgment on it if he wants to, but he doesn't. He just makes mention of it in passing, just like he does in so many other things. He just reveals to people where they're at, what's going on, and goes on with what he wants to say. And uh, so, uh, does the Bible, though, have, uh, you know, usually we look at the word says that uh, out of the mouth of one or two witnesses, two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So does the Bible talk about two men sleeping together anywhere else? Does it acknowledge that such a phenomenon exists? Well, we turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 to 12. And here we come up with this word two. Interesting. Here's the word two again, only in Hebrew. And it says in verse 9, chapter 4 of Ecclesiastes, this is worth knowing, two are better than one. Two what? Because they have a good reward for their labor. So let's keep asking ourselves the question, two what? For if they fall, listen to this, here it is. If they fall, if the two fall, the one will lift up his fellow. What's a fellow? It doesn't say his girlfriend. It doesn't say his wife. It says his fellow. And woe to him that is alone when he falls, for he has not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, uh -oh, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now, interesting about this word, that if you want to look up his in Strong's to find out his fellow, you want to look up his, or you want to look up fellow, you would find out that his and fellow are not two words in Hebrew. In fact, it's one word. And the word in Hebrew is 2270. And it literally means his, it's male and masculine, fellow, another man. And there is a feminine version of this word. The feminine version of this word is used only once in the whole Bible. The number in Strong's is 2278, it's the feminine of 2270. And it's found in Malachi 2.14. And it says, yet she is thy companion 
and it is talking about a man's wife when a man so there is a word which is the feminine version and this the feminine version of this word is wife so what is the masculine version it's an identical thing only with a male gender that's what you have here so uh, it means uh, if you look at the root word of 2270 his fellow it comes from 2266 and it means coupled together or joined together now uh, you've got strongs at home and you can look this up yourself I mean it's you know I'm not making it up it's right 2266 is where 2270 that his fellow comes from it's the root word for it and it means coupled together or joined together look in your new Englishman's Hebrew uh, dictionary and see what that what that's all about what that what it is saying so there it is um, the feminine is a wife Malachi 214 we can look at that if you want to to see the feminine word um, listen to here here it is in Malachi 214 and it says Yet you say, well, he's the uh, prayer. He's talking about your prayers aren't answered. And you cry and you ask out, why aren't your prayers answered? And you say, wherefore? In other words, why aren't my prayers answered? Because the Lord has been witness between thee and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. There's the word thy companion is 2278. It's the feminine of 2270 in Ecclesiastes 4.10. Yet she is thy companion, but it means your wife. And it's the only time it's used in the Bible. And then, but it's used in the Bible in the masculine form, and it's, and it's translated as his fellow. Now, his fellow lies down together in verse 11 to keep warm, it says. And they protect each other. So it's not just a... Uh, uh, not just a passing phase or fancy. Um, I want to share with you some footnotes. This is the Spirit-Filled Life Bible, the New King James Version. And here's what they say in the footnotes on this thing. Now remember, now I'm going to read this all to you again. Okay, I'll read it to you, New King James Version. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls for he has no one to help him up. And if two lie down together, they will keep warm. So here they are, these two companions, who they, they not only lift one another up when they fall, they have a good return for their labor, so their finances are tied together. They uh, are helpmates to one another because they lift up one when the other one falls, and they sleep together. That's pretty... I think it's getting pretty conclusive in terms of this kind of relationship that's being discussed here. And it says, though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. So in other words, and they protect one another. So these hardly sound like just uh, strangers in the night, right? Now listen to this footnote. Remember that now this is the New Spirit-Filled Life Bible, and the, these folks do not like homosexuals. They're very clear on that. So here's what they've got to say in their footnote though. Two are better than one, for a joint investment often has better foundation of capital and thus a better chance of success. If the one partner succeeds, the other one may share in the fruits of his labor. If he fails, he has his partner to help him. Although the image may refer to lonely travelers, keep this in the back of your mind, lonely travelers, okay, who huddle together to stay warm, in the cool nights of Palestine. I want to just stop there and ask the question. If you were traveling somewhere and uh, your car broke down and another traveler come along and said, well, I can help you. Let me uh, sleep with you to huddle together to keep warm. Would you be willing to have an absolute total stranger that you never saw before in your life huddle together with you to keep you warm? Is that very likely? Well, you remember the parable that Jesus said that a certain man that a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and in the, on the way he fell among robbers and thieves? Well, that was a well-known, even into the 1930s, that was so well-known as a road that, that, uh, that if you would travel it alone, you were stupid. You were you almost committing suicide. 
that because you just did not travel on that road alone because thieves and robbers were so, it was so easy for them to hide in the crevices of the rocks and the hillside and to just descend on a traveler. And so, you know, people then were just as much concerned about strangers and robbers and people who would mug you and, you know, you just would not go up to a stranger and say, well, gee, I'm kind of cold. Would you huddle up with me and we'll sleep together under my blanket? You know, but these, this Bible's footnote is so sure it couldn't possibly be a couple. So therefore, they have to be lonely travelers. They couldn't possibly be intimately knowing one another because if they did, uh, it would certainly imply something. So it says, although it may, now get a hold of this though. They will acknowledge that it's two men who are sleeping together, okay? Although the, the image may refer to lonely travelers who tuddle together to stay warm in the cool nights of Palestine, the image of husband and wife is too obvious to ignore. Although the image may refer to lonely travelers who huddle together to stay warm in the cool nights of Palestine, which we already know is baloney, what two lonely travelers are going to huddle together with a stranger, okay? But the image of husband and wife, and yet that word implies the same thing as opposite of wife with male his companion. The image of husband and wife is too obvious to ignore. A married couple are the two that are ordained by God. Now, they don't care for homosexuals one way or another, but they acknowledge that when you look at this, you can't help but to see a married couple because they lift one another up. They are helpmates to one another. They sleep together. They are protectors of one another. They build one another up. They, they, uh, their finances are tied together. They say you can't look at that without seeing a married couple. Only they want to say, but it must be a married husband and wife is what it must be. But the, the context in the, the, the Hebrew here isn't talking about male and female. It's talking about male and male. And yet they can obviously see that it's a couple that's married. And we know that homosexuality isn't something that just happened in the 1980s. And God knew all about it. So here's this obscure little passage that just simply acknowledges that men do sleep with men. And in the process of that relationship, they help one another, they keep themselves warm, they protect each other, they are helpmates to one another. And when the one refers to the other one, he refers to him as his fellow. Now, then they go on and say, in verse 12, uh, about verse 12, which says, uh, though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. So it says here, if verse 11 is a portrait of travelers, when they find themselves set on by robbers, each will come to the aid of the other. And if there be three, they are all but invincible. On the other hand, if verse 11 refers to a husband and wife, but it doesn't because it doesn't refer to a man and a woman, but it might refer to a married couple. So it says, if it refers to a husband and a wife facing the world together, they become even stronger if they have a child, an heir. So that's how they interpret the threefold strand. But I would like to, uh, to take what is the word I'm looking for, uh, exception to this. Because is it necessarily so that if a man and a woman have a child together, they are necessarily um, stronger? Does that necessarily follow? No, it doesn't. In fact, when we looked at the, uh, an earlier case, it was suppose they're unequally yoked. And suppose, uh, and I, I've heard of situations like this. When I was just in Florida, I knew someone who was about, almost got into a situation like this. And people have gotten into situations like this. Suppose the, one of the spouses is into drugs and Satan worship. And the other one becomes a born-again Christian. Well, now they're unequally yoked. And if they have a child, will that make them closer? 
No, now that's probably gonna even help to sever the relationship because the Satanist may want to use the child in an abusive way. And the Christian won't be able to tolerate that. And so they may find themselves in a situation of needing to take the child to safety and leaving the relationship for the sake of the safety of the child. So to say that threefold strand and that threefold strand is necessarily a child is, uh, doesn't wash, that doesn't wash. But I think that uh, what is definitely something that makes a couple stronger is if the third strand is Jesus. Because only Jesus can take a couple, become a part of both of them, and make that relationship much stronger. Therefore, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. It's a lot easier to have a divorce and to be separated as a couple when neither of you are saved. But if both of you are saved, it's a lot harder. A threefold strand is, uh, is not quickly broken. So I, I take exception with the, uh, the footnote. Remember, footnotes are not divinely inspired. They're just simply what people think this possibly means, and they give it to you to help you out a little bit. But I don't think it's a help. Uh, but I do think that if it, a married couple are the two that are ordained, as they said, why couldn't that be a gay couple? Could be. As I said, I don't, I'm going to argue with you. If you don't think so, that's all right. But why couldn't it be? Or, you know, so many times the word is rhema. And that means it becomes a personal word. Why couldn't that be a rhema for, for a gay couple? And why couldn't a, a heterosexually married couple look at that and say, well, I understand the principle. And the principle is the threefold strand. We need Jesus in the center of our relationship also. Although it's not talking about a man and a woman. It's talking about two men. So, um, so there is a second, um, there's a second thing. And I think, so you, you don't have the, uh, the reference here to a man and a woman in his fellow, but you do have the obvious reference of a couple that's facing the world together. So, something we're seeing in these two passages though, is obviously what's true in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 that tells us don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. I mean, if there's something for a couple to learn there, that's it, you know, because you don't want, uh, you don't want to be separated you want, and severed. You want to be growing stronger. Now I want to show you something that we've never looked at before in this church, and uh, it's just something that I s discovered in the Greek in this last year, and that's in John chapter 4. John chapter 4, I believe, has got two interpretations, and both are acceptable because the Greek words that we're looking at, verses 16 to 18, the Greek words that we're looking at can very honestly and faithfully be translated either way. So, in John chapter 4, verse 16 to 18, let me read to you this. Jesus said unto her, Go call your husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidst thou truly. Now, let me show you what this says in Greek. In verse 18, it says, as I was reading King James, it had said, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast, which implies that who she has now is a he, that's not in Greek. He's not in Greek at all. In fact, what is in Greek is 3739, whom? The one. New American Standard translates that as the one. The one whom you now have is not your husband. In that saidst thou truly. Now let's just look at this. This word husband is 435 in Strong's and I'm gonna, one of the legitimate translations for this word is husband. 
So let's look at it from that perspective. We'll look at that first, okay? So if it means husband, and it could mean husband, it's a legitimate translation for it to mean husband. So we'll look at that. He's saying to her, go call your husband and come here. And she says, I don't have a husband. Every time you see this word husband, it's the same word. It's all 435 in Strong's. And she says, I don't have a husband. But it's obvious she has somebody. Isn't that right? It's obvious there's somebody. And he says, yes, because the one whom you now have is not your husband. Well, that could mean that the person she has, if the person she has is a man, if it is a man, then obviously that relationship is a husband-wife relationship, but that husband is obviously married to somebody else. And this, the penalty for adultery in that day, remember what it is? Be dragged out of the city and stoned to death. So if, she's, if Jesus says to her, go get your husband, and she goes and gets the man that she sleeps with, and that happens to be somebody else's husband, she's setting both herself and her lover up to be killed. So therefore, she can't acknowledge and state she has a husband though she sleeps with this man. Because if she does, they're both dead meat. And the wife of that husband, the legitimate married wife to that husband, would be able to raise a ruckus and have them both killed. So she, she obviously has a clandestine relationship. Whatever this relationship is, she's not able to publicly state it. She cannot say, uh, I do have somebody. She doesn't dare say, I have anybody. So in a roundabout way, she says, I don't have a husband. Now that's supposed to imply to Jesus, who can see everything, supposed to imply to him, I'm single, I don't have anybody, I'm free, I don't, that's what it's supposed to imply, but Jesus knows better. And he says, yes, you're right in that you've said you don't have a husband. So it could mean she's got a male boyfriend who belongs to somebody else. Now that we can look at and say, yes, that's what it says. And that's the traditional way that I think this, this scripture gets translated. However, 435 in Strong's does not mean husband exclusively. In fact, it is rarely translated husband. It is more often translated man, meaning male human being, a male person. Okay? Now let's read it that way. He says to her, go and call your man and come here. And she says, I don't have a man. Now what's that imply? I don't have a man. And Jesus said, you've well said you don't have a man because you've had five men and the one whom you now have is not your man. Recognizing she has someone, but that someone is not a man. A legitimate translation because if you look that up in New Englishman's uh, Greek, you will see and if you look it up in Strong's 435, you're going to see that Strong's translation for 435 is man. But it can be husband. It can be, but it isn't often. So if she's got somebody, but that somebody's not a man, it still is a clandestine relationship that she can't publicly declare. If she declares it publicly and openly, she's still in trouble. So for societal reasons, it could be that she's been in five relationships with five different men in order to try out and figure out if she could possibly fit into society's mold. And each time it just didn't work. But she thought, well, I've got to give it another try. And she tries it again and it doesn't work. I just, I can't do this. I just can't do this. And she divorces him. And she tries it again until after five times she says, forget it. I'm going to be who I am and suddenly she's with a woman. And Jesus, knowing exactly what's going on, says, go get your man. And she says, well, I don't have a man. And he says, yeah, that's exactly right. You don't have a man. You've said that well. You had five men, but the one 
Isn't that interesting that he says the one you now have? He does not say the man you now have. King James translates it as he whom you now have. But they have to insert the pronoun he. There is no pronoun in the Greek, though Greek pronouns are available to use. If Jesus were saying, he whom you now have, it would say, he whom you now have. But it doesn't. It simply says, whom only. There is not a he or a she whom. It doesn't say he whom or she whom or it whom or that whom. It just says, whom you now have. So whenever you see it, the gender implied, it's only implied in an English translation, not in Greek. So we have the possibility of a lesbian relationship here. It's a possibility. And it's a legitimate possibility. Although we can't prove it one way or another. It either She's either with somebody that uh, belongs to her or somebody that's not. Well, if you have uh, any questions on these three passages, I will take those. But that's the only three I want to look at tonight because we're going to look at some other miscellaneous scriptures that take more time than what we have to look at with, along with these three than we could do tonight. So uh, if you have any questions on these three, if you didn't understand anything I just shared or anything, you know, just didn't kind of sink in or uh, be happy to answer any of those. Uh, well, I don't know if there are any questions, so we'll just see. Okay? If not, then let's just, uh, let's just close in prayer here for a moment. Father, I thank you that you keep showing us there's all kinds of possibilities of things that you mean, but your word is life, and your word is truth, and in your word, Father, is life. And Father, I thank you that you show us the things that you've been talking about, and I thank you that you've not hidden those things from us, but Father, it does take some work on our part. And I ask you, Lord, to keep us always open and honest before you. Father, we're not trying to prove something. We simply want to find out what you've said. And so, Lord, we just look to you to let the truth of your word settle in our spirit and make it become rhema and life to us. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And he said, take hold of my covenant and I will be your God. Take hold of my covenant and with the angels trod. If you will keep my Sabbath and please me in your ways, I'll be your God and add unto you many, many days. Take hold of my covenant